It's my pleasure to introduce to Melbourne Professor Peter Carroll, who is the Chair of the Department of Urology at University of California, San Francisco, and has been instrumental in setting up a multidisciplinary uh, urologic oncology group. He's also published a wealth of papers and scientific research in the field of prostate cancer, including more recently on the Capture database. And um, I'd like to welcome you to Melbourne. It's my pleasure. I agree to visit. Uh, can I start by asking, as the organiser of a multidisciplinary urologic oncology um, group, do you find it, even within your own department, when you have so many different specialists, do you find it hard to reach consensus uh, when you're discussing uh, specific situations of patients with prostate cancer? Well, we've been together for a long time. We're driven by evidence-based medicine. We're very collaborative. We understand the literature. We understand the strengths of multidisciplinary treatment and care over time. So actually, we have a pretty uniform consensus. I think it's very, very you know, we'll explore all, have strong opinions about things, but, but by and large, it's a consensus-based approach to management. With regards to the capture database, it's interesting to see the findings that the treatment of prostate cancer is often preference or resource-based rather than truly, perhaps, evidence-based. Um, have you had to fight against that a little bit in your own centre? Do you see it in centres that you work in or around you, and how have you addressed that locally? Well, variation in care for prostate cancer is, I think, a big issue because I think it's a perfect example of preference-sensitive care. That means that patient or provider plays a large role on what type of treatment they'll get rather than the cancer grade, volume, extent, patient age, comorbidity. Now, in our centres, we track outcomes over time. We see a pretty good spectrum of management strategies. I think the first thing we try to do is show that there's all this variation. And the second thing we need to do as urologists, medical oncologists, and radiation oncologists is to work harder to determine which patients benefit most by what type of treatment. So I think we've, we've shown people, I think, the road to the future. We see the variation is today. I think over time there'll be less variation. In the last decade, we've seen the um, evolution and production of multiple different nomograms and risk assessment tools. You've been um, involved in developing the CAPRA risk assessment tool. Can you take me through that and where you think its advantages lie in comparison to these other tools? Well, I think you're correct. You see this proliferation of nomograms and probability tables. The problem, of course, is they have not been very well validated. And I think we have to require that these things get validated. What we wanted to do is do something that was quite easy. Didn't require pen and pencil, didn't require a computer could be done uh, by both patients and physicians. It's easy to use, 0 through 10 score, intuitively very easy to construct. Uh, and the nice thing about this, it's been validated worldwide. It predicts outcome very, very well, and it's simple to use. In the last decade, we've seen the um, evolution and production of multiple different nomograms and risk assessment tools. You've been um, involved in developing the CAPRA risk assessment tool. Can you take me through that and where you think its advantages lie in comparison to these other tools? Well, I think you're correct. You see this proliferation of nomograms and probability tables. The problem, of course, is they have not been very well validated. And I think we have to require that these things get validated. What we wanted to do is do something that was quite easy. Didn't require pen and pencil, didn't require a computer. Could be done uh, by both patients and physicians. It's easy to use, 0 through 10 score, intuitively very easy to construct. Uh, and the nice thing about this, it's been validated worldwide. It predicts outcome very, very well, and it's simple to use. In every patient with prostate cancer, do they undergo a CAPRA risk assessment as part of your discussion as to which treatment modality would suit them best? Well, we, we risk adjust all patients. So we, we, I think it's very important to tell a patient how their cancer is compared to someone else's. Is it low grade, high grade? So everyone gets an assessment of what their cancer looks like overall, and that helps them to select treatment. It helps uh, clinicians select best forms of treatment. Again, I always tell people that the outcome is what we're looking for. There are many ways to get to a very good outcome, and I think risk assessment allows us to get to a good outcome. So do you know, um, have any idea how it would apply to an Australian population? Well, I just saw an abstract yesterday by investigators here, and actually the concordance index is quite high in the mid-70s. Uh, the calibration is not perfect, but it actually performs quite well. For a newly diagnosed man, do you think it's essential? I see a surgeon and a radiation specialist, or maybe an oncologist, um, 
and get multiple opinions before coming to a decision? Or do you think one single specialist and a committee behind him can help make that decision for them? Well, I think it's very inefficient to have every patient seen by everyone. We, given the numbers of patients we see at UCSF, we couldn't have every patient seen by a medical oncologist, radiation oncologist, uh, and a uro urologic surgeon. Uh, I think there's, there's most collaboration for newly diagnosed patients between urology and radiation oncology. So, so those patients tend to be seen by both types of providers. The other thing I think is very important is when you treat a patient, you need to make a commitment to them for life. And you just can't concentrate on doing the surgery. You have to understand that that patient might, might recur in the future after surgery and radiation, and you have to have a program in place that allows you to treat this patient over the course of their illness, not just acutely at the time of initial diagnosis. So again, I think it's relatively inefficient to have everyone see a patient, but if you have a well-functioning, integrated, experienced team, it can be run very efficiently, so patients don't have to be seen by everybody. It must get very difficult then when you have patients traveling from long distances to have treatment and then going back to local providers to ensure that they have this sort of long-term plan set up in place. I think you, you address a very important question because we have a lot of people uh, like here come from a long distance for care. We've developed a web-based portal which allows us to track health outcomes over time. So we actually can measure quality of life uh, quite remotely. It's, uh, we have mechanisms where, where patients can get in touch with us quickly if they need to be. We have a good communication system with community providers. So patients can come to us and be treated, go back home, uh, undergo rehabilitation, remain in close contact. And there's a big, big emphasis on survivorship. So we want to follow these patients long term. I think there's new technology, the web, which allows us to do that. With the advent of PSA testing and the um, massive increase in diagnosis of small volume and low-grade tumours. You published also on active surveillance and studied this field. What, what is your protocol for active surveillance? Well, I think, I think one thing I'm quite concerned about, the message on PSA testing has, has not been made quite clear to the public. Patients, primary care providers, the press is, is unsure about the message. The message for me is quite clear and the evidence suggests with time it's becoming even clearer. Doing PSA testing in young, healthy, well-informed men saves lives. That's number one. Two, it does so at the expense of over-detection, detecting some cancers which don't need to be treated. In the U.S. and in many countries, detection and treatment are too tightly linked, and we're trying to unlink them. So we think detecting disease early is important because it saves lives. However, we think it's important to do risk assessment and then treat them selectively. So not all men need to be treated. And I think a lot of the controversy will go away we, when we stop equating detection and treatment. Uh, surveillance, I think, is a very important strategy, and all men with prostate cancer should be, should be uh, given information about active surveillance. It's a good form of, uh, of initial management in men with low risk disease, well evaluated by an extended pattern core biopsy. So what we'll do is we'll be sure they've had an adequate biopsy. Frequently we'll do a repeat biopsy to be, just be sure they have low grade, low volume disease. So for us, it's generally less than one-third of the core is positive, no more than 50% of any single core involved. PSA is generally low, less than 10, stable. PSA density is less than 0.15, no pattern 4 or 5 score. These are ideal patients. We have over 700 men on active surveillance. We generally do PSAs at three to four-month intervals, imaging at six-month intervals with uh, ultrasound, first biopsies done at a year, and then after that every two to three years. When you do your rebiopsies, do you um, specifically try to sample anterior zones? For example, do perineal template biopsies as a, as a way to hopefully improve your um, biopsy predictive value? Well, our outcomes in surveillance now with extended pattern transrectal biopsy are actually quite good. About one, f uh, one quarter of patients require treatment. If I compare those, p treatment to those patients to men I treat right away, I see no difference in outcomes. I've, I've, I look at the the outcomes of radical prostatectomy, newly diagnosed low-risk patients versus those I've watched, progressed, and then treated. No difference in margin rates, upgrading PSA-free survival. So this window of opportunity with the current strategy remains open, we think, for a long period of time. The reason we haven't gone uh, routinely to the perineal biopsy is because it needs to be done under anesthesia. It's more morbid and more, ex more expensive to do. We would use this technique only in selective uh, patients. Mm -hmm. I think it may play a greater role in, in, uh, for those patients who are considering so-called focal therapy. Do you have a rough guideline as to your intervention triggers with regards to PSA velocity or 
tumor volume on repeat biopsies? Well, I think that's a great question because all the interventions now, uh, the endpoints of intervention are arbitrarily defined. Generally, it's been PSA doubling time, a change in cancer grade, or a significant increase in cancer volume. We really started to question PSA right now because it turns out that in lowest patients, PSA kinetics are not a very good predictor, at least of upgrading. Um, both the work at Johns Hopkins and at UCSF suggest that PSA, by and large, at least early on, doesn't seem to be a significant predictor of uh, upgrading. So for our patients, most intervention has been done based on upgrading. You have to be very careful about volume because volume can change uh, small amounts based on sampling error. And we have a lot of men who have undergone serial biopsies, so we've measured this, the variation in volume you would see just from sampling. Uh, so we'd have to see a significant increase in volume before we pull the trigger for intervention. Mm -hmm. But, can, but significant increase in, in uh, cancer volume, uh, cancer grade, PSA is falling out right now, but over time it may be more reliable. We're quite interested, however, in new markers of risk, and we have a big consortium grant looking at new genomic imaging markers of health outcomes, you know, MRI, multiparametric uh, MR imaging, new uh, genotypic and phenotypic uh, markers, you know, urine serum based. It would seem some of these markers and imaging modalities would go a long way towards stratifying risk in men who we're considering conservative treatment. Correct. I think what it would do is, is open up the opportunity for surveillance to more patients. Because I think right now providers and patients are unsure of the outcome. Uh, they're hesitant to, to adopt surveillance because they're concerned that they might harbor a large or higher grade tumor which has been undersampled. We get this right on imaging or these new markers, we can offer surveillance to more and more patients. It remains controversial in the AUA just this year. Um, quite an eminent prostate cancer surgeon quite unequivocally spoke out against active surveillance, claiming that, it, that all studies demonstrate that it condemns a small but definite and consistent number of men to um, under treatment of what turned out to be clinically significant disease, and he found that unacceptable. What do you say against that type of argument? Well, I think everyone can have an opinion, but they should have that opinion backed up by data. So I think what we need is more data, and the data on our experience at UCSF has not shown that. We just haven't seen it. Now, I always tell patients there could be a risk to surveillance. Now, we're trying to identify what that risk is. I can tell you right now it's going to be small. It's not going to be a large risk, and, and we, we try and uh, let patients know there could be a risk, and we let them negotiate their decision. Do they want to take a small risk for surveillance, or do they want to be treated? In, and, uh, of course, with treatment, they would have to understand there could be side effects of treatment. Treatment, no matter how well delivered by the most experienced people, still comes with some risk of uh, adverse outcomes, and those risks need to be quantitated to patients as well. And prostate cancer and high risk in T3 disease, there seems to be more evidence, um, even from your own data, that there is a disparity in survival outcomes when you compare patients treated with surgery versus radiotherapy for high risk disease. Can you comment on where that leaves us now in decision making for these patients? Well, I think it's important for all of us to try and do uh, contemporary uh, comparative effectiveness research. We need to tell patients which form of treatment might be best for them. Uh, in urology overall, probably for the last two decades with PSA testing, we focused on low-risk patients. These are the men we've taken to surgery. Generally for men with high-risk disease based on volume and grade or PSA, we've relegated to other forms of treatment, radiation or hormonal therapy. When we've looked at this in a large data set, we're not the only ones that show this. It's been shown by at least three other groups that in fact the men who might benefit most by surgery have the lowest risk of cancer death are those with high risk disease. So at UCSF now we've, we've uh, done more active surveillance in low risk patients because their health outcomes might be good with surgery or, or radiation. But those men with more uh, high risk features may benefit from surgery. So we have to question age old paradigms based on new information. What do you think in 2010 is the gold standard treatment for clinical T3 disease? Well, there's no gold standard. I think without, for, for clinical T3 disease or high-risk disease based on PSA, uh, grade, volume, or T-stage, these are the patients who are likely to require multimodal therapy. I tell them they can go two ways. They can undo, they go hormonal therapy, followed by high-dose radiation of the prostate and lymph nodes, or they can undergo surgery, followed by adjuvant or salvage therapy based on the findings. Uh, I think both forms of treatment are reasonable. We discuss uh, outcomes with uh, patients, give them a realistic 
idea of what to expect and we let them to make the decision.